<laughs> when the host of a special I seminar, you have no idea how special it's going to be. Uh, so it is, it is our great pleasure to welcome Michael Beats here for the uh, robotics seminar. Uh, he's the head of a major lab at the uh, Technical University of Munich. Uh, they do, I think, uh, basically pretty much everything you can think of in terms of uh, robotics, especially robotics in uh, human spaces. And he's going to talk to us about some uh, manipulation related uh, projects. And, yes. Uh, thank you everybody for your patience, by the way. Yeah, so thank you a lot, and sorry about that, so it seems we can do everything but uh, connecting a computer to uh, a projector, so um, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, work that we are doing in our lab, and what we are interested in is we are developing um, robotic agents um, that are supposed to perform everyday manipulation tasks. Uh, one back. No, one, one more. Okay, so um, so when we look back in AI, so one of the earliest systems, the shaky robot, was supposed to actually do these kinds of things, manipulating objects in the environment to perform some useful tasks. And when we look back in, in uh, AI history, it seems like the uh, shaky uh, system spawned off all these uh, kinds of areas, research areas like uh, representation, reasoning, planning, learning, vision. And those research uh, fields have become alive on, on themselves, which also means like the problems they are solving are much more open-ended than they were in the beginning in the context of producing uh, action. So also these individual fields have done a lot of uh, progress over the last decades. It seems like if we put the tools together um, for actually um, having robots perform actions as humans they do, uh, do them, uh, we have a lot of problems that the, the techniques don't really fit together, and the computation problems uh, that they solve are not kind of really the ones that actually taken together uh, improve the performance of the system. So, uh, yeah, so if you look back, so, um, so uh, Niels Nielsen put a challenge in 96, so what we actually should expect when we see robots is that they, a robot should actually be able to do what we can reasonably expect given the sensors and the effectors um, that it has. And another observation is like if we look at the field right now, it seems like that the AI challenge has, has pretty much moved into the robotics field where we find now roadmaps and white papers where uh, robot, robot co-workers and autonomous robot assistants, robot companions that actually have to perform these kinds of tasks are now in robotics and it seems uh, that uh, the field in AI is not that active anymore. So, actually here is a nice video with um, uh, Eric uh, Berger. Um, doing, uh, uh, cleaning up a, a living room uh, setup, and he does that uh, with a PR2 robot, and he does uh, an amazing um, man manipulation skill when performing these actions. But the trick is that he does the control of the robot with a remote control. And what that means is, even so kind of we are uh, limited in all aspects of the control, but if, if we, uh, we should be able on the software side to actually kind of uh, perform these tasks, given uh, that uh, these techniques, perception, action, representation, and learning, planning, really work together as they should. So in our research, in our lab, so what we try to do is we try to um, understand kind of how we can perform these kinds of activities by building complete robotic systems that actually uh, perform these kinds of tasks. So if you look like 
uh, cleaning up uh, a kitchen has a, uh, or a, a living room table. So, so why are these tasks so complicated? The reason is the tasks are really complicated uh, themselves, but we don't notice it because uh, we perform these kinds of tasks without even thinking about it. So if I go to a table and pick up an object, so uh, I have to decide on uh, where do I have to stand in order to pick up? Which of my hands do I have to use to pick up the object? Which type of grasp do I have to use? Where do I have to place the fingers on the object? How much force do I want to apply in order to, to hold the object? How much lift force do I have to apply? What is the lift trajectory and where do I hold it? And if I look at all these kinds of decisions that have to be made, those kinds of decisions cannot be made once for all, but they are heavily dependent on the context. So if a glass is filled, I have to take it up in a different way uh, than it, uh, I have to do, uh, do it, or that I can do it when it's empty. Or if I take a bottle in order to fill up a, a glass, I take it differently than I, I take it in, in order to put it away. So it seems like that a lot of the intelligence that is re needed in such uh, robot uh, systems is that we have to be able to take uh, ill-defined or uh, vaguely specified uh, action specifications and turn them into the appropriate action uh, at, uh, applied to the appropriate object and perform them in the appropriate way. And this indeed is, is a very complicated and knowledge intensive task. Okay. Yeah. Next, yes. So, how can we perform these kinds of uh, knowledge intensive uh, decision making tasks? So, in order to see how that could be possibly done, we can look at uh, map based navigation. So here, by map-based uh, navigation, we see that we have the problem that the robot acquires experience data, it navigates through environment, collects the sensing data, and it uses that in order to build up a map of the environment. Uh, if we have the map of the environment, then we can use the map in order to perform inference tasks. So we can uh, uh, infer uh, where am I? So where do I have to go? And how can I get from here to there? Okay, if we have these kinds of inference tasks that we can solve, then we can, uh, can specify very general navigation uh, behavior in this way. We can write a routine navigation where we can uh, give a navigation task uh, to that routine and then we have a program that says in parallel continually estimate where you are in the envi environment. Whenever you get lost then actively relocalize yourself and whenever you know where you are you can uh, perform the main task that you have to perform namely navigation. So and for the navigation task we first test whether the uh, destination is reachable. If it's reachable, we compute a navigation plan and then we execute the plan. So what is ha what's happening here is, is, is very nice because we have a very general program that is, uh, is very reliable, flexible, and efficient, and the code is very uh, concise. So the reason we can do that is that we actually embed reasoning methods into the program that rather than specifying as a programmer what has to be done, we have here the estimation of the position, the relocalization, testing whether it's reachable, the computation of a navigation plan, which actually do the main work and the program itself actually only uses these uh, kinds of results of the inference process. So that's kind of the game that we want to play for not only kind of getting a general navigation capability, but that we want to do in order to get general uh, manipulation capabilities in uh, everyday environments. So, so when we do that, this is question, yeah, where do we get models from? So one big assumption that we are uh, making is that the robots 
actually perform everyday manipulation tasks. So that means that uh, the task that the robot is to perform, they are not kind of completely new uh, to the robot, but they, it has done similar tasks uh, very often. And it can exploit the knowledge about the task and the experience in order to make the control program, uh, the control problem simpler. So everyday activities are tasks that are common and mundane. They are made possible through a great deal of knowledge and experience about object situations, which are uh, adequately presented as uh, constraints. And the behavior that uh, has to be generated should be good enough, but it doesn't have to be optimal. So that's nicely displayed by these kinds of pictures that, is, that are actually uh, activity data that we have uh, acquired by observing uh, how different people set uh, the table. So what we see is, even so there are three people of, of different sizes and doing the task uh, in an uninstructed way, the trajectories for the hand motion here is extremely similar and it's very stereotypical. And it, it seems good, but it's certainly not optimal for, for the uh, different individual task. But if we look at the amortized cost of these kinds of things, if we have robot systems that actually perform a task in a stereotyped way, uh, that means like that we have less entropy in the behavior. That means we can learn faster, we can diagnose very much faster whether things go wrong. And there are a lot of uh, advantages that uh, we can actually uh, draw out of the fact that uh, actions are performed stereotypically. Okay. Um, so here is actually uh, the, the sketch of uh, a project that we want to start next uh, February, where we actually apply these ideas of everyday manipulation, where we take web instructions, uh, instruction videos, and haptic demonstration in order to acquire uh, controlled programs and plans for everyday manipulation tasks and execute them on the robot. In order to do that, we use different kinds of knowledge that help us to, uh, to basically extend the knowledge coming out here uh, with important uh, pieces that are typically not communicated. So the background knowledge we are using is uh, probabilistic first order representations of how actions are specified and uh, what, what is the uh, in, uh, intended relations that are uh, important for actions. We equip the knowledge with naive physics knowledge by uh, having routines for simulating um, uh, the actions in uh, physical simulators. We use hierarch hierarchical Bayesian models of experience, also with uh, first order representation language and probabilistic object memories. And uh, so here on the left side, if you look at the knowledge sources, we can see what are the strengths and the weaknesses of the different ones. So web instructions are, um, are very abstract, but um, they kind of uh, communicate the important things. And, um, well, I come back to that. But what is in web instruction, what is not uh, uh, communicated is, for instance, if we say pour pancake mix onto a pancake, it doesn't specify how high do I have to hold the bottle or where do I have to hold the bottle directly. For that kind of information, it's better to look at a demonstration of the same task and actually combine this information with, uh, with the written instructions. And third, it's, it's good if we have simulation knowledge, because uh, a, a video instruction would only uh, show the successful execution of such an everyday manipulation activity. But if we want to say, uh, what would happen if I hold the bottle much higher, then we couldn't get that out of that information source. For those kinds of things, we have to be able to simulate the actions under different conditions. Okay. 
So, skip, skip. Oh, no. Uh, can you go to the here? Or can you go onto the, uh, on to the web page? Yeah, web page. OK, so here's an example of a demonstration we did uh, last fall. So what we are doing is, um, so the, the task is the robot should make pancakes, and it reads instructions uh, from the web. So here's a typical website with instruction. We pass the instructions and use uh, WordNet as a dictionary knowledge base. When we get the uh, words out of WordNet, we connect it to an um, uh, encyclopedic knowledge base. Uh, can we stop that here? Uh, and then we basically, uh, the encyclopedic knowledge base defines all the concepts in the environment. And, and the encyclopedic knowledge base also aligns the concepts that are uh, used in the instructions with the concepts that are used by the robot. So a cup. Is, has to mean the same kind of thing for uh, the, the, uh, the system generating the plan as the system executing the plan. So we uh, translate that, uh, that abstract instruction into a semantic, uh, in, into a first order representation, and then we generate the plan from it. Yeah. So, so one of the problem is that uh, things in the, in the instruction are specified abstractly. So the instruction says, get the pancake mix. But what it's really meant is, uh, get the container in which the pancake mix is. And so we have to identify uh, the object of finding them in the environment. Can you stop it yet? Yeah. Um, so what we do is, in, in, in addition to the um, to the uh, uh, encyclopedic knowledge base, we, we take uh, an online web store and take all the information that is in the web store and add it to our uh, knowledge base. And in particular, uh, web stores have information like pictures of the object. And if we take the pictures, do SIFT features for them, and then the robot can actually use them to at least find the objects if they are uh, facing the robot. Another information that is not in, in, in these kinds of web instruction is the information where the objects can be found. So in this case, we have uh, only a, a small example. So from, in the, from the knowledge in the web store, we know that pancake mix is a perishable food. And from our domain knowledge, we know that uh, a lot of perishable food is actually stored in the fridge. So a candidate place where the pancake mix might be found is the refrigerator. OK, so, uh, but that's kind of the style of reasoning, the kind of reasoning a robot really has to do in order to come from abstract instructions into a concrete control. Okay, then it also uh, has some representation um, about so, uh, the capability it has. So that's essentially semantic web representation uh, where all the action routines it has are described as if it were a, a semantic web service. And then it can query itself can, uh, can I have, uh, uh, do I have the capability of opening doors? And uh, one of our robots doesn't, the other one has. So this robot takes over the fetch and delivery tasks, and the other robot uh, makes the pancakes. Here we see the robot and uh, bring the pancake mix. Then here is, is a typical example of an everyday manipulation activity. So the robot takes the pancake mix, 
has uh, to pour uh, pancake mix onto the oven, then with the other hand it takes the spatula. Uh, when it takes the spatula, it extends its body with the spatula. That means it, it grasps the spatula and then it calibrates the, uh, the spatula with respect to its hand and then it can control the spatula with the joint angles of the robot. So while kind of this robot is still doing the perception task, uh, the other robot is getting out the, the plates from the drawer. Okay, and uh, so these are the manipulation, act and, and then we did another step. We added another step to that uh, demonstration in order to actually assure that the programs are not overly specialized. So that uh, third part was that after the robot has performed the activities, we could <coughs> ask uh, queries about what the robot has done, why, and how it did things, and how things were actually uh, moving. So that made sure that uh, we don't have only kind of a compiled executable program that uh, simply performs the action, but that other than that, the robot uh, doesn't know what it does, but it can actually reason about uh, what it has done and why. Okay, so let's go back to the... Okay, and, and uh, so in, in the spring we did uh, another demonstration where uh, we actually had the robot going shopping and, uh, and basically uh, getting new items that are not in the environment, but then inferring where these new items have to be placed in the environment based on similarity of objects. And we did a second manipulation task, uh, making uh, German sausages. So that means uh, taking sausages, putting them in a two pot in water, fishing them out and cutting bread for that. So the purpose is like, we, we, we want to have a set of uh, human scale everyday activities in order to get a feeling like, what are the perception tasks involved? How, how much manipulate, how much background knowledge do we need in order to perform really these uh, set of actions? So then, uh, so that kind of looks as if we can really program and, and uh, reason, reasoning robots to perform these actions. And then we started to actually look at how, how complex is that problem. So if we really want to uh, program household old robots and uh, equip them with uh, action libraries that, so that they can do the things, uh, how, how much do we have to work? And in order to do that, we actually did data mining on websites that contain these uh, instruction information. So we were looking at uh, Wikihow and in, in the domain of entertainment and food, and there were about 270 categories of instructions and uh, close to 9,000 complete instructions with uh, more than 130,000 instruction steps. So about kind of 50,000 were really relevant action steps that are uh, relevant for physical manipulation. So there are other sim uh, steps like uh, enjoy your meal, uh, which kind of are difficult to realize on the robot. 
And uh, so from all these 50,003, there, there were about 100 uh, relevant action verbs. And uh, most important ones like adding something, picking and placing. Uh, so the top 15 action verbs account for about 50% of the actions in all these instructions. So we also looked at kind of if we have these action verbs. So how complex is an action verb by itself? So that means, um, for instance, if we look at flipping a pancake, so flipping can be done with different objects. We can flip different objects, and we can use different uh, tools. So we can use the hands or spoons or what, whatever. Uh, so that's kind of the taxonomy if we kind of look for flipping. So that's kind of the complexity that we have to face. So another thing we were looking at is um, what is really the, the challenge in performing action specifications that come from the web? So kind of one of the main challenges is that these action specifications are vague. So there are instructions like push the spatula under the pancake, but you shouldn't really push the spatula under the pancake, so you should hold the handle of the spatula and push the blade of the spatula under the pancake. And you should do it in a way that you can lift the pancake safely, that you don't uh, damage the pancake, and you don't push uh, the pancake off the oven. So that's important because I think if we really uh, want to have robots with the competency to, to perform everyday manipulation ac activities, then uh, the robots have to be probably uh, capable of uh, performing action specifications of their type, which means kind of highly incomplete, so they have to be uh, completed by, by the system, and uh, highly ambiguous, and also what I think is important that the parameterization of the action will in, in many, many cases be in the uh, desired uh, consequences of the actions and uh, what you don't want to have as a side effect. So you don't want to damage, uh, but it won't tell you the force with which you really have to push the spatula. So uh, in order to do that, what we do is we actually try to learn the first order probabilistic model of uh, these actions and uh, and use that for disambiguating and for completing such uh, incompletely specified actions. Okay, the third step with uh, kind of the problems that we have if we perform these kinds of activities is that yeah. also at the instruction level, uh, things are highly incomplete. So at the instruction level, we said, um, I know, pour the duff onto the pancake and flip the pancake. So that's the only thing that is really specified in, in, in these kinds of instruction. But if we want to come to plans for robots, so they have to be uh, at, at this level of detail. And here we see some of the challenges we have. So we have, for instance, objects that completely change in the course of action. So we start with X but then we have eggshells and, uh, and the yolk. And we talk about objects like milk, or stuff like milk, but we mean the containers that contain the milk. Um, here, kind of instead of baking, the uh, instruction only says, wait for three minutes and then flip the pancakes. So what we have to do is we, we have to infer the physical processes that actually uh, change the state of the object from this state to that. So we need baking. And uh, if we have to bake the pancake, we actually have to in, uh, add uh, steps into the plan, such as switching on the oven. So, um, so but what, what that tells us is like, if you look at instructions from people, then they typically only contain the uh, instructions that contain information that are untypical or uh, 
uh, contain information for people. All the other thing that everybody knows is not even uh, set in these kinds of instructions. So we, we conclude from that 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 type of information that really also has to be provided within the robot control program. Okay, another thing that I've already mentioned, so in artificial intelligence, we typically uh, describe actions in terms of preconditions and their effects. If we look at uh, actions uh, on autonomous mobile robots, kind of what makes the, the models of the actions is mainly kind of the way actions are parameter parameterized and how the parameterization actually correlates with the consequences of the actions. And so, so for a robot, it's, it's not like I have to flip the pancake uh, uh, in, in order uh, to get it done, like uh, adding a plan step, uh, step in, as in classical planning. But the question is really, how do I, do I turn the, the pancake without destroying it and uh, doing that? So, which also means this is kind of where we have to uh, put the reasoning capabilities of our robots. Yes. So let me just uh, go and uh, talk about some of the principles that we find very important uh, for, for the plans that we run on our robots. And if the, the first principle is um, that the basic behavior specification of the robot has to be uh, or should be done in a concurrent, reactive, high-level uh, uh, programming language. Today you see many of uh, a number of research groups that start with uh, actually specifying that kind of uh, behavior through automata, because you kind of need events that uh, make the system go from one state to another, and these events can occur to any, uh, any point in time. Um, so, um, but what the people experience is that, of course, the state space uh, of these automata explodes. And it's very difficult to program, really, these kinds of uh, behavior in uh, an automata. So, but we have high-level programming language that actually allow us to decompose and to specify these types of programs modularly, so where we can specify if you have to uh, break up that kind of procedure, then you have to do the following as a cleanup. Or uh, kind of you can specify that one process is actually monitoring another one, which also means if the first process uh, terminates, then I don't need to, to uh, monitor anymore. So we can do a lot better there. Um, second principle uh, I also talked about is um, Again, in, 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 in AI, we often do, the plans are fairly uh, simple control structure. They are often only uh, sequences of actions, and sometimes they have uh, conditionals because you need uh, some information at runtime to make a decision to go one way or the other. But I think that's kind of uh, the wrong decision to actually say, to put all the intelligence that we have into the reasoning system that reason about the plans. I think it's a lot easier if we already put the reasoning competency in the plans. So that makes man plans a lot simpler. They are more robust, more general, and uh, it, uh, it makes the plan language more complicated, but the plan itself a lot uh, simpler. Okay, the next thing is, um, the next thing we want to do is we don't want to only put, make decisions at execution time where we do, uh, think about whether we want to perform one action uh, in this way or this way, but we would also like to th think ahead uh, in longer uh, periods. So we want to think about the cause of action. And for that, it's, it's uh, actually necessary to represent uh, plans 
as uh, robot control programs, uh, as um, to represent robot control programs as plans. So, uh, plan in, in, in our system is an expressive robot control program, but it's uh, it's specified explicitly so that the program has access to the data structure and can at runtime reason about uh, that program and uh, and modify that. Okay, the, the fourth point, I've already made uh, my points. So, um, so I think an important building block for uh, smarter robot control systems is that we base them on naturalistic action specification, that we look at how people specify actions and we, uh, we try to build execution systems uh, that have enough knowledge embedded inside to make these kinds of uh, turn these uh, naturalistic action specification in executable program pieces. And the last point uh, I want to make is uh, so these kind of things um, also sound as, as uh, the problems become a lot more uh, complex. But I think what we heavily have to ex exploit is that in, in, many, uh, in many applications that we have, uh, be it in the, in the kitchen or in, in a factory domain, it's like that the robot has to uh, perform kind of the same kinds of actions over and over again, and that we have to have robot control systems that are much better in performing that task after a week than they are when they do it at the first time. At the moment we have, I think, few programs that actually exploit uh, that kind of structure in the environment. When should I stop? Um, maybe 25 minutes late starting, so. Yeah, yeah, but. <laughs> I suggest you go ahead, and anybody that wants to leave can leave. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. So now I give some examples about uh, how to to embed reasoning into our control program. So, so as I said, so the game we are playing is, uh, as I've illustrated with the example with map-based uh, navigation, that we actually take decision points in the program and we perform these decision points uh, with a knowledge-based uh, processing method. So, so in our programs we have actually three main ways of how we embed um, decision making into the control program. So here's the first example is um, we, we, we turn control decisions into first class objects. So for instance, uh, I can have in my control program an object with a data structure which says the place where the robot should stand in order to pick up that object. And this, uh, this data structure is, uh, exists, is a persistent object. So why do I want to have that kind of uh, control decision. The reason is, uh, sorry, I don't have the videos, uh, but um, think of a robot actually, uh, it's supposed to clean up a, a kitchen table and it's <coughs> entering a room. So when entering a room, it should already have an idea where it uh, should go. But when it comes to the table, it kind of sees the object on the table. And as it comes closer, this, uh, the, the estimations of what the objects are, whether it needs two hands or one hand, uh, and where they exactly are, they become more accurate. So what should happen is, I should always have a kind of that position where I want to pick up the object, but in the course when I act, these revisions should be uh, revised based on evidence. They should be made uh, more accurate and, and so on. So the second decision is kind of the obvious one. If we have conditionals in our uh, in our uh, uh, plan, so um, then we actually uh, <coughs> want to perform these decisions 
based on inference. So for instance, we want to go, or we want to place the object. So here, that's an example in the context uh, of the manipulation task where the robot pours the pancake mix on, onto the oven. And then it, want, it should place the object somewhere where it can see it afterwards and where it can reach it afterwards. And the third application is that I need to determine the parameters of actions. So for instance, if I, if I uh, have to set the table, I have to infer which places should I put uh, objects and which objects I should uh, place at which uh, uh, place. And so depending on which persons participate and uh, and what their preferences are, what they typically eat. So, okay, so these are the three modes of how they are. Another kind of very important aspect of the way we incorporate uh, inferencing in, in our robot control programs is uh, kind of how we implement uh, the knowledge base. So we, we use kind of Prolog, which is an old-fashioned uh, AI language. And it, it really, for us, it's not kind of the inference mechanisms that uh, come with Prolog that make it so important. But it's, uh, there, are, there are a couple of, of, uh, of very important advan advantages that Prolog uh, brings with us. The one is it's kind of like SQL. So I can basically have come some statements and ask what I want to have, and the system somehow retrieves that information, combines it, and gives me uh, what I want. And a prolog looks from the outside just like uh, a logical expression, so it has a declarative meaning, and it's interesting that way. The other reason that we use Prolog is um, that it's kind of an uh, um, industrial strength system. So we have implementations where we have uh, very good uh, foreign language interfaces. So that's important because uh, in a robot control system, I don't want to have a huge symbolic knowledge base that I, where I basically have to take uh, generate facts and assert them, and I can uh, reason only about, uh, about the facts. So in a robot control system, I really want to take all the data structure that I have at the implementation level and that are designed for kind of making the, uh, the control program uh, effective and, and competent. I want to simply use them and uh, use them as a virtual knowledge base. So, for instance, if I use a data structure like uh, for uh, probabilistic uh, estimation of, of the robot position, which might be a kind of a, um, a particle filter-based uh, implementation, so then I can uh, basically have a virtual knowledge base where we have uh, predicates like uh, is the position estimate ambiguous, is a, a position estimate uh, accurate, and uh, where exactly believes the robot uh, that it is. And then we actually use these kinds of relations, but compute the truth values of these relations out of the data structure that implements the, uh, the uh, particle filter. So the robot doesn't have an unambiguous uh, position estimate. Uh, well, it, it has an ambiguous position estimate if there are multiple local maxima in the probability distribution that have more than a certain weight. Or kind of if I look at how accurate is the uh, position estimate, then I can basically look at the variance of the global maximum and so on. But I think what we should do, if we uh, symbolically reason about robot control programs, we should first of all use the data structures that are already there and actually uh, have predicates that draw 
upon uh, concrete queries the relevant information and uh, provide. Okay. Um, let's go. Okay, so we can skip. Um, skip. Um, maybe I just go to the plan. Okay, so there's one last aspect I, I want to talk about, and, and that's kind of the, the planning aspect of the system. So what we have done is we, we basically have uh, extended the plan language in a way that if we look syntactically on, uh, to the plan language, that all kind of reasoning problems uh, that we have here, they cannot, cannot be performed effectively. So they are... Uh, computationally not tractable and, and whatever. Um, so the question is, if we actually use syntactic plan languages that are so complicated, so how can we uh, reasonably assume that uh, robot control systems can reason about themselves and uh, modify themselves, debug themselves in execution time? And the basic idea uh, for that is, so we don't have to characterize the plans <laughs> syntactically. If we think about what are the plans that any robot control system has, in particular one that is supposed to uh, use a, a plan library, then the only plans that it has is kind of the, the initial plan that is simply the composition of parts of the plan library, and then uh, plans that the robot has uh, generated through plan transformation. So uh, taking that operational def uh, definition of a plan language, we can say that all plans that the robot actually has to deal with, they have a property P if, uh, if the plan schemata in our plan library have the property P and the composition uh, of, of the initial plans and the transformations preserves the property P. And now we can think about properties of plans that we can actually incorporate as programmers into the plan and design the plans so that we can make them a lot easier to reason about. So one of the important uh, things we do to make plans easier to reason about is the use of declarative statements. So what we make is an assumption that plans can be actually structured into code pieces that, uh, that have names like achieve a certain goal, perceive a certain goal, uh, and maintain a certain goal, prevent a goal, and so on. And uh, if a plan segment, uh, and we make the assumption if the plan uh, segment uh, is named achieve G, then uh, it's <coughs> if and only if uh, it's intended to achieve G. So what we are doing is that we are using the programmer in order to assert what actually the plan pieces do. And uh, when we do kind of reasoning uh, uh, about the plans and we modify the plan, we actually only use these uh, declarative statements. And this is the way basically we used in order to explain what the robot was doing and how it do it, whether it had alternatives. So it basically, it, it turned out the problem of understanding the plan in the syntactic problem of uh, syntactically retrieving uh, subplans with uh, certain uh, uh, patterns of, that, that satisfies certain patterns. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so what I want to uh, basically bring across is, I guess that um, at the current state of, of our research field, I think it's a valuable thing to actually look at complete human scale manipulation uh, tasks 
and that it's important for, for us right now that um, we try to understand what the computation problems are that we solve by actually building systems and see whether they work, what, what kinds of problems they have. In terms of technical solution, I think uh, there are certain ingredients of the robot control systems that are important uh, so that they can run successfully. So the first thing was like the behavior specification itself should be uh, stated in high level concurrent reactive uh, plan languages uh, or uh, programming languages that have the right abstraction to specify that kind of behavior uh, transparently, compactly, and modularly. Second point is uh, that uh, we should make the plans themselves smart by kind of having uh, control decisions in the uh, plan that are inferred, that can be inferred through knowledge-enabled reasoning. And I, I think that by doing that, we, so for one thing, we can decouple reasoning and the, the behavior specification. And I think it's a lot easier to actually specify behavior that is robust, flexible, and efficient. And the third point is, even if, if we have such expressive plan languages, uh, we can still reason uh, about them in a semantically uh, deep manner by kind of asking for the help of programmers so that have to represent the goals that the, the subplans have to perform explicitly and we have to have the right um, prediction mechanisms through simulation and we can learn models of uh, plan pieces based on uh, data, on experience data. Okay, thanks a lot for the attention. And itself we have basically simplified things so so I mean we, we had programs that were more general but we wanted to limit the way uh, in which the program uh, kind of uh, could break so for instance when it took the uh, pancake mix out of the fridge kind of the pancake mix was the only thing in the in the fridge and the reason was simply because we had too many points in, in, in that uh, activity where things fail and, uh, and everybody was showing it, their research results so we wanted to make sure that kind of not everything depends on everything. But in, uh, in yeah. of that specific demonstration in yeah. other so, instances, right? Um, I think, yeah, I think the, the, the gain is really to push for generality, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, for instance, in, in these uh, object recognition tasks, so we, uh, we have basically loaded down all the images of all the objects uh, of that web store, I think that And then I guess we, we tried with about 30 objects in the environment. And, uh, and, um, but, but then we have the problem that in order to do that, we have to see the front face. And so, so we also have people looking at, uh, once we have the front face, can we do a, a complete reconstruction of the object or for and back? So I mean, it's difficult to say it's, it's like, trying to get step-by-step step more general. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you were talking about, uh, what's it called, the everyday activity assumption? Yeah. And you were saying that, well, you know, day by day, uh, you know, they learn, the performance can improve, uh, which sounds great. But it, it seems like it might be a kind of transient phenomenon. I mean, 
you know, we're as humans, you know, are very good at this. Of course, much better than robots right now. And where this is a very valuable thing for us to do. One thing humans don't have is the ability to share what we learn at the level of detail and efficiency and so forth that, that robots could have un unless we limit them to stop the robot revolution. Yeah. Assuming we're not worried about a conspiracy of floating robots, then whatever any one of them learns, they all learn, right? Have a giant hive mind of pancake flipping robots. So what what's the what is the steady state of this? It seems like seems like uh, seems like, you know, at any given point in time there's two or three robots that are learning something and the rest of them the billions are just downloading it. I, I think kind of for robotics it's it's uh, the computation problems will change a lot. So so one we look at the robots that kind of perform tasks or are to perform tasks for the first time. And then kind of when we have the first robots performing these tasks, uh, how can we get kind of these kinds of capabilities for many robots? Because when we look at, for instance, the incompleteness of instructions in the web, as soon as the first robot kind of has built a complete program and uh, kind of disambiguated steps, I think these kind of things are not necessary to be uh, done by, by other robots anymore. So I think, yeah, so, so I would say still from the, the idea that is still important from everyday activity is kind of how it's dominated by knowledge and how it's dominated by experience because even if you kind of know these things, you still have to execute it on, on that particular robot and, and with that, with those particular, so you need the experience part and you also need the, the knowledge. And I think for humans it's more important that they do everyday activity because they can, don't have that direct access to the experience data of, of others. And I think for, for robots that might be different, hopefully, yeah. Other questions? Thank you again. Thank you. I forgot to mention that Michael is uh, here tomorrow as well.